Um, so this is called Functional Programming Basics in ES6. And what this talk really is really, it's not that ES6 has functional things per se in it, unless you count like tail call optimization, which we'll see. It, it's more so just functional programming basics in JavaScript, but we're going to rely heavily on some ES6 features that can make it a little easier for us in a syntactical manner. So that's why it's mainly called an ES6. So I'll give you a sample of some of the ES6 features we'll look at, and hopefully some of you have seen ES6 or even attended the ES6 talk that was uh, here earlier today. So with that, we'll dive in. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I am a web developer, uh, mainly JavaScript and front-end work. I've done some back-end as well with Rails and PHP. Um, I'm on GitHub as Jay Fairbank, and Twitter, I'm El Pavo Pollo. And I also blog at blog.jeremyfairbank.com, mostly on JavaScript. Uh, and I work for a company called Push Agency. We're a design and development agency, and focus a lot on front-end stuff, obviously. In addition to that, we also have our own product called Simply Build. It's a website builder, hosting, and domain management. Um, and it's perfect for small, medium-sized businesses or personal use. So if you're interested in something like that, want to set up a simple website without coding it yourself, I highly recommend it. So I want to start off, we're going to start off kind of at a theoretical level. I wanted to just put this out. What is a function? And it's mainly rhetorical. If anyone has anything they want to respond to, you're welcome to. But no? OK. So what I want to focus on, though, is this picture. And you probably remember seeing this way back in like grade school or middle school math. And this was what you knew as a domain and a range. And a function was explained as something that pairs these together. That something in the domain, it will map to exactly one thing in the range. Never map to more than one thing. And so it's something about uniqueness. At the same time, you probably also know the obvious definition of a function that we all know as programmers is something that takes an input and it produces an output. So functions like f of x equals x plus 2. It adds two to the argument. g of x equals x squared. I square my argument. And then when I apply those functions, I can pass in values like f of 2, that is, equals 4. g of 3, 3 squared, equals 9. But if we tie this back to what we saw with the domain and range, you'll see what I'm talking about. So when I invoke this f of x with 2, with 3, with 4, that's my domain. Those are my inputs. And then the values I get back, that is my range. So what does that tell us between that semi-abstract definition and then what we know as what a function really is? It's this unique mapping from an input to an output. And you're probably saying, Ugh, math, why are we talking about math? We're here about functional programming. But it's critical to understand where this kind of started from and how it's so important and crucial to even functional programming. And so you may have heard of this guy, Alonzo Church. If you haven't, maybe you heard of the Church Turing thesis from some of your CS background, which there's multiple definitions to what the Church Turing thesis is. In sort of a simple definition, you could say, whatever I, as a human being, could solve on pen and paper, a computer could solve it. So Alonzo Church was actually a professor of Alan Turing. And so they came up with this thesis many, many years ago. And as you know, Alan Turing came up with the Turing machine as a way to represent computation and solving problems, which eventually leads us to computers. Well, Alonzo Church, he took a different approach, and he came up with what's called the Lambda Calculus. So while Turing's approach was very imperative and very um, a series of steps type approach, the Lambda Calculus was more focused on just using functions for all of your computation. And so this nice little quote here kind of sums it up. It's a way to represent computation in terms of function abstract, abstraction and application using variable binding and substitution. So let's unpack that. So first off, let's return to f of x equals x plus 2. When I say bind, what I'm saying is it's a parameter of my function. f of x has a parameter x. So anything that refers to x in the function body, that's bound to that parameter. When I supply a value to my function, that's the substitution. So I pass in 2, 
x becomes 2, and I've now substituted that in, and I can get back my value of 4. There's a couple other things about the lambda calculus in functions. They're anonymous. So technically, we would represent this in the lambda calculus by wiping away that g and just representing this as a mapping. x maps to x squared. That goes back to what we just looked at with domain and range. We're mapping an input to an output. And so we're treating these functions as though they are expressions and they're units of computation. These functions are also single input. So technically, in the lambda calculus, you wouldn't say that x and y map to x plus y. We would say x maps to another function that maps y to then the sum of x and y. And this may sound familiar if you are somewhat familiar with functional programming, and it's a lot like currying. So that's nice, that's math, okay, but what about the functional programming part? And I stress I want to show you where this kind of comes from. And so lambda calculus, it shows us the power of functional computation. We can represent everything with these anonymous functions. And functional programming, then, is a way for us to actually bring that to life in our programs and in computer science. So with that being said, now we can jump into what is functional programming. But here's a nice long quote from Wikipedia, which kind of sums it up. In computer science, functional programming is a programming paradigm, a style of building the structure and elements of computer programs that treats computation as the evaluation of mathematical functions and avoids changing state and mutable data. It is a declarative programming paradigm, which means programming is done with expressions. And then the troll TR, TLDR is programming without assignment statements. But really, here's what we're going to focus on, the key concepts for today. It's this idea of declarative versus imperative, and it's ways we, we want to tell the computer what we want. We don't tell the computer how to do it. First class functions. Just like the lambda calculus functions were expressions, in a functional language or functional style of programming, functionals are, functions are their own uh, units of computation, their values, their expressions. Referential transparency and purity. This is properties of our functions that they're only going to be taking in certain inputs, and the output they produce are only based on the input they take in. They're not going to mess with outside state, or they're not going to have any side effects. Recursion. This is a really big one, especially when you start looking into how do you deal with looping in a functional manner. So recursion, where you write functions that call themselves maybe multiple times and then reach some base case. Immutability, this is another big one. Since we need to deal with state and we don't want side effects, then we can't mutate that state, so we always want to produce new state. Partial application and currying. These two, they're similar, but they're different. And it's the ways that we can uh, sort of apply values, kind of that substitution I showed you with lambda calculus, apply that to a function without actually invoking it yet. And then finally, composition ways for us to string functions together to take small functions and build up much larger functions. Okay, so there will be an ES6 ahead, I mentioned that, and so we're going to quickly just review some of the topics or features we're going to use in this code. So first off, there's this const keyword you've probably seen, and it's basically like a variable. It's, it's going to be block scoped, and that's not going to really matter in most of our examples, but you can think of this const as just being of our statement. Now the thing about the const statements is you can't reassign. It doesn't mean they're not mutable. So if I have an array that's assigned with const, I could still mutate that array with push or splice, but I can't reassign anything to that particular identifier like greeting there. Let, it's similar to const. It's again, it's going to be block scoped, but in this case I can reassign values to it. So it's basically almost the same as variable, except there's no hoisting. You're going to be hoisted to box scope. Yes? Oh, it is. Is there any way we can... Can it zoom out, maybe? To not overscan? Well, sorry guys, I didn't know that was happening. 
Let me try mirroring because I know that was working for me earlier. Nope. Scale. If I go, well, this is. So you say it's a scanning option? Sorry. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so sorry about that. Uh, well, there was the const I was referring to, if you couldn't see that. Um, there's the let, which I just mentioned. We also have arrow functions. And to declare an arrow function, you have your parameters inside parentheses, like a normal function, but we don't have the function keyword anymore. And then you uh, delimit the parameters with the body via this fat arrow. If you don't use any braces like that first one add, then it's going to use that one statement, x plus y, as an implicit return value for your function. The second one, if we use the braces, then we still do have to use an explicit return for returning a value. So these are pretty straightforward translate to just normal anonymous function expressions in JavaScript. We also have what are default parameters. So I could set up a default value for my parameter. So if I don't pass in that parameter, it'll use whatever that default value is. And that's just as if in a function you normally checked for the presence of that parameter and then assigned it. The spread and rest operator, it's the ellipsis, the three dots. If you use that in the parameters list, then that's kind of like variable number of arguments. So it's a better pattern for dealing with special arguments keyword in JavaScript. And so we can grab it, those uh, variable arguments out with the uh, rest parameter. And likewise, we can use it when we invoke functions, and that's when it becomes a spread operator. So it's as if it's spread out the arguments, kind of like when you call the apply method on a JavaScript function. And finally, and we probably won't get into this one with uh, some array stuff I had, but this is a way to destructure arrays and also use the rest operator. So in that example down there, I can assign x, since it's in the zero index spot on the left, it gets assigned to foo, which is the first value in the array. And then for y, I'm using the rest or spread operator. And that says, take everything else that's left in the array and assign that to y. So that's sort of the ES6 introduction. And most of it will be pretty self-explanatory as we go through the examples. So now we'll start by looking through all the key concepts. So first is this idea of declarative versus imperative. And we're going to start with imperative first. So this is normally what you're probably used to when you program. It's the way that you tell the computer how to accomplish its task. So you give it sort of a series of steps to perform a certain function. It means you're probably going to deal with some mutable data that you're going to change or mutate to accomplish the goal. And this is typically what you might do with C or C++ or Java. So if I had some function like this where I wanted to double numbers, just take an array of numbers and double each one, this is how I would normally approach it with imperative. I would have some array to hold the result value. I would have a for loop, which I'm mutating or reassigning the value of i in this instance as I loop over. And then inside the loop, I'm doubling the number at a certain index, and then I'm mutating that doubled array by calling the push method. And then finally, I return this doubled array. But notice that was a series of steps. I had to mutate data, and I was telling the computer, here's how you double numbers. So let's contrast that now with a declarative approach. And this is what you typically associate with functional programming. And the concept is I'm telling the computer what I want, not how to actually do it. So you can end up with a lot more concise and simple looking functions than in these more rudimentary imperative examples. So algorithms, since they're not a series of steps, it's going to be more a composition of functions. And obviously, since we're talking functional, we're not going to mutate any data. And examples of uh, declarative languages are 
SQL, HTML, Haskell, which is a functional language, and domain-specific languages. So returning to double numbers, if I want to do this in a declarative approach, all I have to do is call the map method on numbers, and this is inside the double numbers function, and I pass in some other function called double number. So I'm using composition, I'm using the native map method that's available in JavaScript, and so I've reduced the amount of steps, so to speak, in my program to actually accomplish the goal of doubling numbers. So again, I'm telling the computer, I want my numbers doubled, but I'm not telling you how to actually do that. That's up to the, in this case, the native JavaScript engine, like V8, if this was on Chrome. So next, first class functions. Functions, their expressions, their values. So what does that look like? What do I mean? If we had a couple examples here, so I have a add function, and notice, even though I've declared it as a function declaration, I can assign it to another variable, like add alias. So the fact that I can assign it to another variable tells me it is a value, and it is an expression. I can also assign just anonymous functions, like this anonymous multiply arrow function. And then these functions that even have properties, like a name property, or length, or as you know, the call and apply methods that are on functions. So the fact that all these exist, it tells us that functions are expressions, they are first class citizens in our programming language, just like numbers or booleans or strings. So that means functions can be arguments. So if a function is an argument, then functions that take them, are, they're typically called higher order functions. And so we have a couple examples here, like if you had an event library where you would want to react to some uh, event, like update, and you give a callback that gets called when that event gets issued. And then we have our double numbers example we already saw. And just highlighting, you see, we're passing in functions to other functions. And so functions are arguments. That means also functions can be return values. So here's another simple example, what I mean by that. So I have a function called addition factory. It takes in an x and it returns a new function that takes in a y. And that new function then will actually finally produce the result of x plus y. And so I can use that, invoke it with one, assign it to this variable add one. That gives me a function. And so now I can invoke add one to two and that gives me back three. So see we returned a function, to, we produced a new function and we can use that function. So that brings all sides of how functions are expressions. And so you probably know this by another name too. And that's closures. So closures, if you're familiar with them, it's a way for us to reference higher level variable scopes. And the name you can think of, it's like closing over. So you're wrapping over whatever was available in a higher scope. And then you can reference that in your function body. And this is really important for functional programming, especially partial application and currying. So going back to addition factory, I'll show you what I mean. If we highlight here, addition factory, it took in that x and it reduced, produced a new function, but that new function still referred to and used x. So that new anonymous function is a closure. Here's some more examples, and you've probably seen some samples of something like this where you can see how closures can get pretty tricky when you think about this. So I have a few functions, some global state called my value, and then I'm calling these functions in different orders here. So first off, I call closure. When I log out my value, it's referring to that globally available my value. So it logs out foo. Next, when I call tricky closure, it's also referring to a my value, but notice it's local to that function, and I've set it to bar. So because it's local to that function, obviously I'm going to log out that and not the global my value that we had before. And it doesn't affect that global value either. When I assign that local let my value, the global one still stays the same as foo. So if I call closure again, it's still foo. Now if I call this other one another tricky closure, I'm setting my value equal to hello world and logging it out. But notice I did not bind that to the function with var or let or const. So it refers to the global one and it's gonna mutate that global state, it's gonna change it. So now if I call foo again, which always refers to the global one, it's gonna get that new value that I had produced, 
And then again, just to show you tricky closure, it's local, it's not affected by all these changes. So that shows you kind of at a high level how closures work, how they can refer to higher scopes. So now we're going to talk more into some of the theoretical properties, so to speak, of functions, like referential transparency and purity. So you've probably heard this word before. Sometimes you've seen it associated with purity. Sometimes you may hear them just they're the same thing. We'll keep them a little separate. So the basic gist of what I mean by referential transparency is whenever I have a given input, I'm always going to return the same value. And that goes back to what we discussed earlier with lambda calculus, a unique mapping from input to output. So you could almost just replace these function calls with, with whatever the return value is, and it would not change how your program executes in the long run. And obviously, if we're depending on only input, we can't depend on state that's outside of the function, so any global state. So here's what referential transparency kind of looks like. I have a few functions where I double a number, I square it, and then I can add six. And we can reduce that down. When I said you could take a function call and replace it with its return type, this is what I was kind of saying. So I have add six calling on square, which is called on double number, which is called on three. Well, double number, that's the same thing as six. Two times three is six, right? So it's the same as if I had just called add six, passing in square, which I passed in six. Well, squaring six, that's the same as 36. So it's as if I just passed in 36 to add 6. And adding 6 to 36 is 42. So it's almost as if I had just assigned it to 42. Now this is just kind of theoretical ideas. It's not that you would literally go into your programs and just replace stuff like this. But that's kind of what I mean by you could replace it. It's this thing always produces the same thing. And to kind of tip off that, if we look at doubling number three, and I called it multiple times, it always returns six, never changes. So let's contrast it now with something that isn't referentially transparent. So here I have a function called add to counter. It increments some global counter, and then it returns the sum of its input and that counter value. So if I call it with one, down there in the bottom, I call it add to counter one, and I add that to add to counter one again, you'll notice I produce a new value. It's not the same. I produce two and I produce three and I add those together. So this is not referentially transparent because it depended on that global state. So next related to referential transparency is this idea of idempotency. And it's kind of like a special case. It's this idea that I can take a function and I can call it an argument and I could call it again and again and again, and I always produce the same value. So it looks kind of like this. f of x is the same of f of f of x, which is the same as f of f of f of x, and so on. And to give you concrete examples of that, the absolute function, the identity function, those are idempotent functions. You know with the absolute value, if you call it, in this example, on negative 1, you get 1. And if you keep calling absolute value on 1, you just keep getting back 1. So no matter how many times I call it, it's as if I just called it once. Same thing with the identity function, which just returns whatever the input was. Something that isn't identity would be this add to function. It is referentially transparent. Calling it once will always produce the same value. But if I call it once and pass it back into it, I do keep getting back a new value. So that is not identity. So now the third in this kind of triangle of purity is purity. So think of it kind of like strict referential transparency, and again, you might just hear that they're the same thing. Basically, you don't have side effects, which means you're not going to have global, you're not going to have shared state, you're not going to mutate it. Even your arguments to your functions, they can't be impure, like arrays that could possibly mutate. And you can't do any I.O. either in a pure function. So no printing out with console log and no reading in. Um, from a prompt if you're in the browser environment. So here's some examples of just pure functions. Pretty straightforward. Add, it just adds x and y. Doesn't do anything special. Capitalizing a string, again, strings are immutable, so I can't mutate that, and so it's pure. Same thing with that two-title case function. So what's impure then? Well, let's look through each of these functions one at a time. 
So this get name function, it's impure because it depends on global state. Something else could modify that global state, change whatever my name is mapped to, and therefore my get name is not going to produce the same value every time, so it's impure. Printing a name, if I pass in a value and print it out, well, I'm printing it to send it out, so technically that's not pure either. Or this silly add function, it does return x plus y, but it's also modifying global state. Because it had this side effect, it's considered impure. And then finally, this hobbies mapper function. It takes in, I've, I've passed in that array of my hobbies above. It produces a new closure, which will take in a function, and then map that function over the array of hobbies. Because I passed in a the array, and because it produces a closure, that closure is impure, because it ends up depending on state that could mutate later on. And so that, even in this case, even though it's depending on an input, it's still impure because the array could mutate with a push or a splice or something like that. So that's kind of the theoretical properties, so to speak, of uh, functions in uh, functional programming. So now let's get to some stuff that's more concrete and applicable, like recursion. So this is where we want to solve a problem, and we want to do it in terms of itself. So it's like breaking it down into smaller, smaller pieces, and we'll solve it at a smaller level, so to speak, and it'll build back up to the final result. If you're big into math, you love proofs, this is really similar to kind of doing an inductive proof. Programming, it's a function that calls itself. And this is something in functional programming you'll find, instead of doing while loops or for loops, you're going to use recursion then to solve these type of problems that would normally require a loop. So the first example, we'll look at the factorial function. You know, it's where you multiply the number times n, n minus 1, and then another n minus 1, and keep going until you get to 1, and then you stop. So 4 factorial is 24. If I was going to do this in sort of an imperative approach, I might do something like this, where I have a result variable, and I also take in my n, and I'm going to mutate those values or reassign them to produce my value. It was a series of steps. I changed data. It's very imperative. But I could take this more recursive approach like this, and let's look at it a little further. So it's just got a few lines of code, and we'll point out what, what's important about it. First thing you'll notice is we have this base case. So since this is a function calling itself, we have to establish some point where it needs to stop calling itself, or it's just going to create an infinite loop. So in this case, if it's factorial, we know we have to go down to 1. So if it, n is less than 2, or even if just n is equal to 1, we'll say, or stop here and return 1. So if this is not the case, then we're going to do the sort of the recursive call, the recurrence in this problem. And that's going to be where you take n and you multiply it by factorial on n minus 1. So it follows really closely to what you know about the definition of factorial. So returning to factorial 4, here's what kind of the execution would look like. We'd call factorial 4. We know that's going to end up calling factorial 3. So that's going to leave us with 4 times that. Factorial 3 will lead to factorial 2. Factorial uh, 2 leads to factorial 1. And now we've reached our base case where it's 1, n is less than 2. So now we can actually return back 1. And then we just start multiplying back. 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times 3 is 6, and 4 times 6 is 24. And so that gives you kind of a picture of how these types of recursive functions will execute. But it does raise some interesting questions. How is performance, how are these going to really perform? So what if I wanted to call a factorial of 100,000? What am I going to get back? I'm not going to get back anything, actually. I'm going to get an error. It's this range error called maximum call stack size exceeded. What does, that, what does that mean? Why am I getting this error? Well, we're going to see this lies in how we're doing our recursive call. So let's go back to watching the how this function gets called with 4. So I'm going to put this call stack next to it. So right now we're at the beginning. We're at our main. We're going to start calling factorial 4. So that's going to put that on the call stack, factorial 4. And then I get down to the recursive call, and that's 4 times factorial 3 again. But notice I've added to the stack, because it's waiting to get back whatever factorial 3 is before it can return what factorial 4 is. And this keeps happening. Factorial 2 stacks up, factorial 1 stacks up. So you might already notice what's the problem when we call this with factorial of 100,000. Our stack just keeps growing. In this case with factorial 4, we're not going to get very far, it's not going to get very high, so 
it's not gonna really hurt performance. Factorial one, we can finally pop off the stack, get our values, and we got 24 back. But what's happening with factorial 100,000? So this is order O n. That means we have 100,000 calls, it's 100,000 stack frames. Depending on your environment, for Node, that's gonna be, each stack frame is gonna be about 48 bytes. There's a max stack usage limit, which is about one megabyte. I think it's actually a little less than that. So if you do the math, 100,000 calls or stacks times 48 bytes converted to megabytes, we're looking at 4.58 megabytes that we just tried to use and we're only limited to less than a megabyte. So we gotta figure out a way to solve this and still make it recursive. And so this is where we find out about tail call optimization. So tail call optimization, it's a way for these, us to optimize these functions. It's a way where we don't reach these limits. We don't exhaust, exhaust our max stack size. And the basic idea is, instead of keep stacking, what if we could just take whatever's on the top of the stack, pull it out and replace it with something else? And the way to do this then with tail call optimization is you make sure that your last statement is always just the recursive call. So you would typically rewrite these with some sort of accumulator then to where you could keep track of what the current value is. And of course this is coming in ES6 and it's already possible to do this with a transpiler like Babel. It will convert your code in a way that makes it tail call optimizable. So here's the unoptimizable version of factorial. When we look at that last statement, if we go through the order of execution there, well, first of all, obviously, we'll evaluate whatever n is. And then we're going to do n minus 1, so that's the first thing. Then we're going to call factorial, and remember, that's going to possibly call another factorial down the road, so we're just stacking up. And we have to wait for it to return before we can finally do n times that, which that is the last statement in our function. So the last statement was not a call to factorial, the last statement was n times a call to factorial. So here's how we would optimize that then. We're gonna switch around our arguments and how we actually call the recursive function. So now we've introduced this accumulator function, which is, or parameter, sorry, called a Q, and we'll set it to a default value of one. In the base case, instead of returning one now, we'll return a Q. And that'll work because as we work our way down, we'll eventually have one, or sorry, it's, we're actually doing this in reverse, but again, with the base case, we know we're done, so we can return whatever was accumulated. So now what we've done in our factorial, we still have the n minus one there, but notice instead of doing n times factorial, we've now moved n times a cube as the second argument. So that way we can keep accumulating four times three times two times one to return the ultimate value. So going back to how would this look in order of execution, you'd have n minus one, then you'd have your n times a q, and then the actual final statement now will be factorial, the recursive call. So now if you try this, you get back a value. It's infinity, but we didn't have the error anymore. So that's how tail call optimization can help you in this instance. And if we map out then how the call stack looks in this case, we'll see that we have our main, we call factorial four with a implicit one. Remember, it was a default parameter. Well, that's the same as calling factorial three and four. So we can just replace that. That's why you have to make sure the last statement is a recursive call so that it can optimize and just replace it, essentially. And that's the same as calling factorial two and 12, which is the same as factorial one and 24. And then we never end up exhausting the call stack. We just keep replacing stacks. So that's one, probably prototypical example you see of recursion. So the next one I want to look at is the Fibonacci sequence, because this one's going to have some other performance implications I want to point out. So remember the Fibonacci sequence, it's the sequence of numbers, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and basically whatever number you're at, it's always the sum of the previous two numbers, except for your base case, which could be 0 and 1. So there's our base case, and then we have our recurrence. You have n i minus one plus n i minus two. So the previous two numbers added together. So implementing this as a recursive function, it would look like this. There's our base case. n is less than two, so that'd be one and zero. And then our recurrence, Fibonacci of n minus one plus Fibonacci of n minus two. And then let's look through how this would actually 
uh, get called. So if I called Fibonacci 1, takes around 0 milliseconds. Fibonacci 5, again, pretty quick. Fibonacci 20, pretty quick. Fibonacci 30, I'm getting a little runtime now, 13 milliseconds. I call Fibonacci 35, it's up to 131. That's like order of 10. Fibonacci 40, now we're up to 1.5 seconds. Fibonacci 45, now we're at 16.6 seconds. And so if we call Fibonacci 100, who knows how long that might end up taking. I don't want to find out. So if we look at the runtime on this, we see it's an exponential growth. This is not a good runtime. And there's a reason for this. And I want to show you kind of what the recursive call tree looks like. This is the only image I could find, so we're using Fibonacci 6. But it highlights really well what the problem is here. And that's, we are ending up computing some of the same values more than once. So if I call Fibonacci of 6, eventually I get down. I end up calling Fibonacci of 4 two times. I call Fibonacci of 3 three times. I call Fibonacci of 2 five times. And I call Fibonacci of 1, which is it's the base case, but still, three times. So immediately, we're, we're doing a lot of work we don't need to. Why do we need to keep recomputing values that we've already at one time computed? So we want to take an approach kind of like this. We're going to build up the result. Um, from the leaves of this tree. And it's, the hope is to avoid recalculating these values. So essentially we're going to kind of go up the tree making these reverse calls. And again, so we're going to end up applying tail call optimization to solve this and dynamic programming. So remember we need some sort of accumulator. In this case, remember Fibonacci sequence, each number depends on the previous two numbers. So we'll actually have two accumulators, current and next. And notice I'm setting them equal to the first two values in the Fibonacci sequence, 0 and 1. And when I make the recursive call, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass in next will become the new current. And then I'm going to add current and next. So I'm adding n minus 2 plus n minus 1, or, well, n i sub 1. But I'm adding those together to get the next value. And then in the base case, where I've finally reached zero, I'm going to return current. Because, remember, I'm adding current next. That becomes the new next. And then next becomes current. I know that sounds like a tongue twister. I'm sorry. But eventually, you'll have the right value when you reach the base case in current. So if we looked at how we would call Fibonacci 6, in this example, we have Fibonacci 6 with this implicit 0, 1. And that's the same as Fibonacci 5, 1, 1, and so on and so forth. And remember the middle, that was the current parameter. And that is the Fibonacci sequence, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and 8. And now if we measure performance, all of them, super quick. And so that's the beauty of taking TCO and even dynamic programming where we're avoiding recalculating. So dynamic programming is one of those approaches you can take as an alternative to memoization. So some really deep stuff, that's a lot of the recursion stuff. And now I want to switch gears to sort of the final part of this talk, which is looking at ways we can uh, apply parameters to functions or create queried functions and compose them. So we'll start off with partial application. And the basic idea of this is I want to assign values to function parameters without actually invoking it yet. And that's just going to produce a new function that has those values already sort of filled in. So in some sort of mathematical notation, I could say f of x, y equals x plus y. g of y, I'm going to partially apply 1. That produces a function where x is equal to 1 then. And so now g of 2 would be 3. So in actual JavaScript code, we would have this. Remember our addition factory we had before? We kind of manually did our partial application with it. But now we can take the partial application approach. But we're just going to do a small atomic functions like add, which just adds x and y. So in JavaScript, you can actually use the bind method, which normally would just bind the this context. But any additional parameters you give it will become partially applied arguments for that function. So I'll say add.bind null, because I'm not really binding this for anything. And I'll pass in 1. So that way, I'm creating a function that will add 1 to its argument. And then you could also just write your custom written partial function to accomplish the same thing. So how would we create this partial function? It's actually pretty simple and pretty short. So we're using some of those spread rest parameters, uh, operators I talked about. 
So first thing, we're going to take in the function, and then we're going to take in all the applied arguments. Any arguments, it could be a variable number of arguments that I want to pre-apply to the function. And remember now, it has to return a new function, and this new function might take in more arguments, so again, I'll use the rest operator, and then I'll finally, because this is a closure and I have a reference to the original function, I will invoke it with both the partially applied arguments and the new arguments that came in. And I had highlighted those, but I skipped past that. So that's partial application in a nutshell. So why would it be useful? Well, it allows us to do this kind of building up functions from the smaller pieces. I work with more atomic things like add, and then I can make the add one function or the add five function just by partially applying something to the add atomic function. So in that sense, we could remove some of the duplication. I don't have this uh, addition factory function anymore. I don't have to repeat that pattern because I can just use a partial function to apply these arguments for me. Here's how you might use it. So I have this multiply function, and then I have the double number function, which we showed this earlier where we just wrote out double number, we wrote out doubled numbers, and they used each other. But in this case, I can just have the atomic multiply function. I can partially apply two to that, and that gives me a function that will double whatever comes into it. And so I can take these smaller pieces to build up this doubled uh, numbers function again. So that's partial application. So very closely related to it, but different is currying. And you've probably seen like tons of JavaScript articles. I think I've seen like 10 blog posts in the past six months about currying versus partial application. So it's similar to partial application, but it's more so like you've baked that partial application directly into the function. So you would just normally invoke the function as normal, but until you've supplied all of the arguments that that function expects, it'll just keep returning a new function with those initial arguments you supplied partially applied. So yeah, we'll keep returning it until everything gets filled. Once we have them all, arguments supplied, then we will actually call the function. So here's how you might do that. We'll have an add function. It takes three arguments, x, y, z, and adds them together, and we'll pass it into a curry function. So I could pass in all three at once, and that'll work, and it'll invoke the function, add one, two, three, I get back six. I could also do them one at a time. So I call add with just one. That produces a function that I pass in two to. And again, a function that I pass three into. And it, once I've gotten all those calls made, then I get back six. This is similar to what you just saw in the previous example, except I'm just going to assign them to variables. I'll let you kind of explicitly see what I mean by this. If I call add with one, I get back this add one. Add one with two, I get back an add three. And then finally, add three with three gives me six. And you can kind of mix and match depending on if the curry function you're using supports this. So I could pass in two and then pass in, or pass in one and two, then pass in three, and so on. So how do you actually implement a curry function? Now this one, it's really tricky and it uses some of the ideas we've already seen with partial application and recursion. So the first thing, we gotta make sure we know the arity. We gotta know how many arguments this function takes. We can implicitly let it be set to the length of the function which if you create a JavaScript function and you say like arguments A and B, it knows it takes two arguments and that's gonna be available in the length variable or property on the function. Else you have to explicitly pass it in in this case. So we need that because we need to know once we've gotten all the arguments passed in. So we're gonna return this closure and it's gonna take in a variable number of arguments. If we haven't gotten all the arguments back yet, then we're going to make a recursive call. So we'll make a recursive call in curry. The function will supply to it will be a partially applied function where we take in all the arguments we just got and we partially apply that function and then we're going to curry it. And then we make sure that we decrement the arity so we know we've gotten some of the arguments now. Eventually we'll get to a point where the arguments that are passed in are greater than or equal to the expected length of the function. And in that case, now we know we can finally invoke the function. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty deep function. Um, and all these, if you're interested, I, I'll give you some slides at the links at the end where you can look at all these code samples if you're interested. So why currying? Well, now we can take that functional 
uh, partial application example I had where we doubled numbers. And we can use currying now. So I'm going to first create this curried map. And this map function, I didn't get a chance to show it because of time constraints, but it's a map function for arrays, but you pass in the function first instead of an array. And that lets us, allows us to make a curried map. And then I'm going to create a curried multiply. And so I can call the curried map, which expects a function, with multiply passing in two, and that's going to create a function that will multiply its arguments by two, because this is a curried function as well. And that's how we can create the double numbers function. And then we can call it with our array of numbers, and we get back two, four, and six. So it's, it's really powerful what you can do with currying. And if you're interested in it more, I definitely encourage you to check out Lodash, because it's got currying involved in it, and may, many of you probably may be using Lodash or underscore. So the final thing is function composition. And this is kind of the high level of what it looks like. It's this idea of chaining functions together where input into one produces an output, which gets comes a new input for another function. So it's, again, related to partial application and currying, we're taking smaller pieces and we're building up bigger pieces from it. So it's kind of like a pipe. If you've used maybe Gulp or some, a build tool like Gulp or other things where you have this kind of pipe system or like a Unix shell where input from one the output from it goes to another input and you keep going. That's kind of what comp we're doing with composition. And it's a good way for us to help enforce modularity and separation of concerns. And I'll skip past the mathematical notation. Um, so let's look at some things of what you could do with composition. So in this first one, we have our multiply function. We've curried it because we know about curry now. And we can use that to create a multiply two and a multiply three function. And then we can compose those together. Composing them together, would make a function that would multiply by six, because you had multiply two, multiply three, two times three is six. And these functions, they're gonna flow from right to left, well, right to left. So that composed function, it'll call multiply three first. Whatever that produces then will be passed into multiply two. And that's how we accomplish getting multiply six. Same thing here to show you why that right to left matters. If I had a function like this with add and subtract, Curried, and then I create an add five where I compose add six, add one, and subtract two. For it to produce there on the bottom that value of eight, when I add five to three, it's going to go right to left. So subtract two from that, add one, and then add six. If it went left to right, you'd get a different value. So how would you create a compose function? Well, there's two ways. If you want to create just a simple one that takes in two functions, then you just take in your f, you take in your g, and you return a new closure that will take in any variable number of arguments. And then you just call f of g of the arguments. And see, so you'll see, since g was the second argument, it gets called first with the arguments. That's how it flows from right to left. Now, if you wanted to do something more complex that takes in a variable number of functions, then you'll have to do a little more complex work here. And you still produce a closure that takes a variable number of arguments, but then you're gonna call this reduce right method on the array of functions. And you may have seen that, you may have not, you may just know about reduce, but it's a way where we can sort of fold over an array and just produce one value. And so basically what it's doing there is just successively calling each function with the output from the last function. And we return that. So that's functional programming basics, at least the best I see and could fit in, obviously, in this amount of time. But I just want to make sure I highlight, you know, why functional programming, because we hear about it a lot now with React and other libraries. So we saw we can create these really concise, elegant solutions to our problems. Fewer steps, more composition. We can also help enforce modularity better, because we have these more atomic functions. They're focused on one thing. And then when I need something more complex, I compose them together. Immutability also can help us eliminate data race issues. And you can still have data race issues in JavaScript when you deal with a lot of asynchronous HTTP stuff, even though it's single-threaded. And unit tests could end up becoming simpler because you're not, you're trying to push out any state changes or mutation as far away from your pure, pure function as possible. So then you're just doing unit tests on functions. And then finally, I have a huge list of uh, some resources and these slides will be available online if you want to refer to these 
uh, later on, or I can keep it up for a minute. Um, Professor Frisbee's Mostly Adequate Guide to Functional Programming. It was something that came out a while back. Um, he produced a really good readme on some of these same concepts I explained. And he probably explained it even better than I did, because it's in nice print, and you can take your time with it. Um, Babel, that's the ES6 transpiler that pretty much everyone uses. So if you've not checked it out, definitely check it out. Lodash and Ramda, they have a lot of functional helpers. Uh, a lot of these functions we've seen, so you don't have to implement them yourself. Clojure script, that's a uh, implementation of Clojure that transpiles the JavaScript. Immutable JS, it's a library from Facebook. It has a lot of immutable data structures like lists and maps, and they're really performant actually. Uh, of course, React, and then also Redux, if you've heard of those, are really good for functional programming. So that's it. Thank you so much for coming out.